In many ways, George III's reign was the dawn of modern Britain. After those dark days of Jacobite rebellion, the Hanoverians were at their peak, and step by step, things were getting brighter. Although, of course, life was still an uphill struggle for most of us. Well, this is Eccles Pike. It's a hill just above Chapel in the Frith, which is just down the road from Castleton, where, of course, the uh, garland ceremony takes place. Now, I came here very early on May Day morning to see what I believed was an equally ancient traditional ceremony. We've been dancing on Eccles Pike now for 25 years. Uh, Morris dancers across the country have been doing it for hundreds of years, welcoming in the summer. Our first year was in 1993, um, when uh, I suggested, having danced with other clubs around the country on the 1st of May, that we came to Eccles Pike and danced to welcome in the sun and the summer. It's a traditional thing to do. It's been done for hundreds of years around the country and uh, as far as we know it's going to continue on. So it seems that starting a new tradition can be fairly straightforward, especially if you're copying something that's been tried and tested elsewhere. And it's dawning on me that something very similar could well have happened 200 years ago here in Castleton when the bell ringers at St Edmund's Church copied bits and pieces from what was happening elsewhere and changed what had been their traditional May Day parade into what we now call the Castleton Garland Ceremony. And the evidence for this, which admittedly is all circumstantial, points to it happening in the reign of George III. Now, you can read about this period in any number of history books or academic papers, but I found a Penguin paperback by Steve Roud called The English Year to be a treasure trove of information about the nation's calendar customs, and that includes the Castleton Garland Ceremony. Now, we know that by the end of the 18th century, many of the old May Day and Whitsun celebrations had been moved to May the 29th. This trend started back in the 17th century, but moving the May Day celebrations back to May the 29th would have been encouraged, to say the least, by what happened in 1752. The old Julian calendar, which Britain had followed up until then, had too many leap years, so it got out of step with the seasons, like a clock that had been running slow for hundreds of years. Correcting it, had the effect of bringing everything forward by 11 days. So, from 1753 onwards, May Day has fallen in what had previously been the middle of April, which of course was problematic for garland makers. Now, in 1760, George III came to the throne, and because his birthday was June the 4th, the May the 29th holiday sort of became associated with him rather than the long-forgotten Jacobite rebels. In 1761, an Oxfordshire clergyman noted in his diary that on May the 29th, many of the local cottages had been decorated with boughs of oak. And in the 1780s, Lord Torrington wrote that on May the 29th, every carter's horse is adorned with oak. So it seems that oak was now associated with support for king and country, just like the festivities on May the 29th, which always had been known as Restoration Day up until this period, when people suddenly started calling it either Oak Apple Day or Royal Oak Day. Now, I haven't been able to find out exactly when and why the name change occurred, but it's interesting to note that the uh, schoolboy practice of nettling those people who weren't wearing oak was often accompanied by party political name-calling. The medieval practice of decking houses with branches had been to ward off evil spirits, but this revival was more in the spirit of putting up bunting and showing the flag. It extended to roofs and even church towers, as it still does in St Neot in Cornwall. 
And of course, St Edmund's Church gets similar treatment in Castleton. But as well as branches, the garland gets put on the central pinnacle after it's hoisted up from the king's shoulders on what used to be the finale of the ceremony. The strange and unique form of Castleton's garland makes more sense when you see it in the context of 18th century May Day parades. In medieval times, garlands were made to bring into church, but in the 18th century they were also being taken from door to door by tradesmen with the aim of collecting pennies. In Abbotsbury, the children still did this with their garlands until, as we heard, their tradition ended in 2013. Now, back to the 18th century, and Roy Judge, the folklore historian, did a lot of research into these uh, tradespeople's parades, May Day parades in this period, and he discovered that the milkmaids used to uh, build their garlands around their shiny pails and plate, and so their garlands had to be carried by a porter, which left the milkmaids free to dance for pennies. But the chimney sweeps went one better with what became known as a Jack in the Green. This term was coined in the late 18th century and it referred to a man, invariably a sweep's apprentice, not carrying but wearing a framework of greenery to become a garland that could walk and dance by itself to entertain the crowds and raise money to see the sweeps through their lean summer season. And because it was successful, it was copied and you can still see this Victorian version of a Jack in the Green in the Royal Nutsford May Day Parade, not too far away in Cheshire. <laughs> Further south, in Deptford and Hastings for example, there are modern festivals which feature revivals of 18th century Jack in the Greens, although you'll also see green men there. Now, green men are ancient mythical symbols of verdant fertility and they crop up in medieval churches. So they're nothing to do with Jack in the Green, which was the name given to the chimney sweeps 18th century dancing garland. And in the same way that Nutsford copied the idea, the Castleton ringers could have been inspired to go one better and change their traditional May Day garland, which could have been like these modern day ones that are still made in Oxfordshire, into a man-sized, bell-shaped money spinner to top the bill in the Castleton May Day Parade. The weight of the frame and the foliage would have meant that the bell ringer who wore the garland certainly wouldn't be able to dance. That would be left to his colleagues, and he'd need to ride through the village on horseback, an element that was borrowed from the old Whitsuntide Lord of Misrule game when it was amalgamated with the May Day Parade to form the Castleton Garland Ceremony. But elsewhere, such as here in Kilburn in Yorkshire, the Lord of Misrule and his wife have survived and become a mock mayor and his comedy mayoress. And they tour the village in a cart, make speeches. I have been the Lord Mayor of Kilburn for one year and one day. Be a free mayor! And organise free drinks at the village pub. But taken all together, that's not so different to the garland ceremony. Although, of course, Castleton has more pubs, as well as music and dancing, and of course a unique large garland. Traditional small May Day garlands used to end up displayed in church, as they still are in Charlton on Ockmore. But the ringer's new garland would have been too big for that. However, thanks to the revival of decking, okay, try that for size. they could still show that they were top dogs in Castleton because the church bell tower was the tallest building in the village. So, when they decorated it with greenery and their special bell-shaped garland, they were clearly showing that they were second to none when it came to flying the flag for king and country. So, in every way it seems, the ringers would have eclipsed all their rivals from the old May Day ceremony but it appears that they may well have retained a symbolic reminder of the old May Queen in the Queen Posy, which still sits in pride of place on top of the garland. Addy also wanted to know about the garland tune's origin, so he consulted his colleague Frank Kidson, a musicologist. 
who pointed out that it was a popular regional Morris tune based on a country dance that was first published in the 1750s. So there you are, several pieces of admittedly circumstantial evidence that point to the fact that the garland ceremony was a product of the late 18th century and that it was as much a salute to the good times of uh, George III as it was to the merry old days of Charles II. We know from Addie's conversations with Castleton's elders that the garland ceremony didn't change much during the early and middle years of Victoria's reign. But in the 1890s, the railway finally reached this previously remote part of the Peak District. And in 1894, the passenger trains of the Midland Railway began speeding through the Hunt Valley. Nowadays, there's still a good service of regional express trains on this line, but the only ones that stop are these elderly pacers, which rattle their weary way between Manchester and Sheffield, calling at Edale, Bamford, Hathersage, Grindleford, and here at Hope. And on summer weekends, they also bring small groups of ramblers and hikers here into the Hope Valley. But the vast majority of visitors come by road, so nowadays the station's often deserted. But back in the 1890s, when Hope Station had waiting rooms and porters, it was a major destination for day excursions from all of the surrounding conurbations. And so when this station opened, the number of visitors coming to Castleton rocketed. Previously, to get there, you either had to walk or else come by horse. And that meant that although the place was popular, visitors were numbered by the dozen. From the summer of 1894 onwards, excursion trains brought them by the thousand. Although I suspect that there would have been nothing like that number of uh, people, day trippers, coming to Castleton on May the 29th, 1895, which was the first opportunity that train travellers would have had to come to see the garland ceremony. And that's probably just as well because when they got to Castleton, instead of seeing the entertaining spectacle that they were expecting, what they got was an old-fashioned village jamboree. An alcoholic knees up that was solely for the benefit of the villagers because before the railway, few others could get here. So what we know is based on the memories of local people collected by Addy and Sharp in the early 1900s. Before 1897, the ringers themselves did the garland dance, although it wasn't unknown for their high-spirited neighbours to join in. Nevertheless, this ceremony with dancing for pints and a man-sized mounted garland was clearly a descendant of the 18th century Jack in the Green May Day parades. But there was also a man with a besom brush who led the garland parade and a sort of pantomime dame riding at the rear. Now, I think that these were characters from the medieval Lord of Misrule game, but in the garland ceremony, they did the stewarding. And the sprigs of oak that everyone wore and the hoisting of the garland onto the church tower could be traced back to the revival of patriotic decking in George III's reign back in the 1760s. But 100 years later, most of that had been lost in the mists of time. So nobody questioned the new generation of Victorian antiquarians who came up with the theory that because May the 29th had become known as Royal Oak Day, that meant that the garland ceremony had to be a commemoration of Charles II's legendary escape from the Roundheads by hiding in an oak tree. So Castleton's Jack in the Green was now seen as being a representation of Charles hiding in that royal oak tree and he became known as the Garland King by just about everybody except for the ringers who actually organised the ceremony because they remained true to the old tradition. So those very first railway day trippers 
who came to Castleton in the hope of seeing a regal garland ceremony, but have gone home disappointed. However, the local businesses who naturally wanted the garland ceremony to be spectator friendly, well, they pressed for change and after a couple of years, they got a result. It all happened in 1897, the year of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. It was a time when the nation was celebrating the monarchy with everything from children's pageants like this one in Nutsford to commemorative tree plantings like this one on the Triangle here in Castleton. And I think that Henry Shepherd, Castleton's brand new dynamic village doctor, who went on to become chairman of both the parish council and the Garland Committee, well, he could well have been involved in negotiating the change. Well, as we know, he wasn't able to persuade the ringers to reschedule their ceremony to a time that would be more convenient for visitors, but he did manage to persuade them to buy this regal jacket so that the chap who carried the garland would at least look like a king when his floral burden was removed. And they also gave the pantomime dame character a coronet to wear. So that role changed from being a comedic steward who kept the parade in order to a more stately one as a veiled queen. And that name stuck, although since the 1950s, when the character was first played by a woman, her official title has been the consort. But the most important change to the ceremony was that the dance was now performed by village girls. As a result of this, their families got involved with the stewarding of the parade, sweeping aside the need for an old-fashioned besom. Now, the ceremony took on something of what was then the popular Merry England style. And I believe that this new spectator appeal is what saved the ceremony from the imminent demise that many had been expecting. But that change in 1897 was only possible because there was someone in the village who was able to create the girls' new dance. And Kay Harrison from the Castleton Historical Society has been researching this aspect and recently she uncovered the long lost identity of that original dance mistress. And she's gone to the bull's head to break the news to mine hosts, Michelle and Pete. Um, now the question is, who was the first dance mistress? Now most people think it was actually Ivy Johnson standing here. Um, she was from the Peak Hotel, um, very musical family. Uh, but she would have only been eight years old in 1897, so not likely to have been her. We found some interviews with some elderly residents um, in the 1960s who were actually children round about the turn of the century. Uh, and they said that it was a Miss Partington that used to first dan teach the dancing. And we found out that she was called Annie Partington. She was a music teacher and she lived here at the Bull's Head. And she was a daughter-in-law of the landlady. This photograph was taken in either 1897 or 1898 and we think that Miss Partington is the lady standing there right in the middle. This was taken to, um, to celebrate the change from the men to the children. So that, that's the first year they've had children. Yes, we think it's actually the oldest photograph that there is of the garland oh. ceremony. Oh. So the children's uh, dance that you see today actually was created right here in this pub and it's still going on today. Within two years, Annie and her family had moved to Lancashire to run another pub, so her role in the survival of the garland ceremony faded from memory. But Dr Shepherd remained at the centre of village life for the next 30 years, and I think that his role in the changes of 1897 could well explain why the garland procession stops to dance at what is still called Doctor's Corner. All the other stops are outside the village's six pubs, where all those in the procession get a liquid reward. But this stop's different. It's on the corner of Back Street, next to what used to be the doctor's house. Back in his day, this wall had a gate in it that led into Dr Shepherd's garden. From his gate, he got a grandstand view of the dancing. Now, the question is, 
did this amount to VIP treatment for bringing this new look to the ceremony. Dr Shepherd retired in 1924, but his successor, Dr Bailey, continued to get the same special treatment until he retired in 1962. Later, the gateway was walled up. The surgery moved to Hope, and for a few years, to help keep traffic flowing, the procession didn't stop there. But in 1990, the Garland Committee decided that this stop had become part of the tradition, so they still dance at Doctor's Corner. And an earlier incumbent, John Winterbottom, who was the medical officer and public vaccinator for Castleton for over 40 years, also had a connection with the Garland story. That's right. His coachman, George Watts, is the earliest Garland King whose name we know, and he retired from that role when his master died in 1870. He then handed on his old livery coat, which he wore for the ceremony, to his successor, Thomas Hall. But in 1897, it was out with the old and on with this new regal look, when Hall became the figurehead for the revamped garland ceremony, which had been turned into a salute to Charles II from what had been a long-standing village tradition. Now, as it happened, those changes from a jack to a king and from Morris to maiden dancing gave the ceremony a stronger connection with the local community, if only because the dancing girls all had proud parents. And so, consequently, in the late 1890s, the garland ceremony got a new lease of life. And that change had come about thanks to the arrival of the railway. And the story of the garland ceremony continues in part three.